Mic check. Mic check. Hello everyone who is watching. Welcome to our 13th Journal Club. We are doing something special today. Instead of having a guest, we are looking at the safety and efficacy data of the three SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that have recently been popular in the, in the news. Um, it's important for everybody to know about how these trials were conducted, what all parameters were measured, and how do we decide whether something is safe or not. Our presenters today will be, actually, I forgot to mention Dara in this. I'm really sorry, Dara, uh, in the post. It's fine. But yeah, it's fine. It's fine. it'll be Maria. Uh, she's a graduate student in the University of Warsaw. Samriti, she's a graduate stu student in the, in the University of Ottawa. Tanu, uh, she's a graduate student in the University of Florida. And Dara, who is uh, a graduate, also a graduate student at University of Paris Circle, which I just pronounced how to say. Thank you, Dara. <laughs> uh, right before we begin, we have a five minute video of some of the underappreciated superheroes, the scientists who worked day and night for making this vaccine possible. Not, all, not just one vaccine, all of these vaccines possible. So give me a second. I'm going to share my screen and we'll go from that. Okay, everybody can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Actually, I don't have to, sh oh, never mind. Let's do this. On drugs and vaccines are feeling. At this point, being so close to what kind of could be considered a finish line, it feels very surreal. We've come a long way in 12 months. The people working on Did drugs and vaccines it? are feeling pressure like you never have. I mean oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I realized I made a mistake with my screen sharing. Okay, so I'll do this now. Everybody ready? <laughs> All right, I'm going to begin now. Sorry, guys, for the confusion. At this point, being so close to what kind of could be considered a finish line, it feels very surreal. We've come a long way in 12 months. The people working on drugs and vaccines are feeling pressure like you they never it? have. I mean, this is, there's never been like it's this. Not. A global pandemic killing sure. millions of people. I don't think... Don't know it's being played on the stream directly. Anything could okay. have prepared me for, for this. No. I never dreamt that we would be the first first ones uh, to, uh, to show that our vaccine could uh, have an impact uh, of <laughs> efficacy uh, against uh, this, uh, this virus. There's no question the pace of work has increased, but this is not unfamiliar. Uh, uh, this is something we do for other vaccines as well. We are in a different moment now than we were when we started in January and as we went into the phase one in March. Um, and now the vaccines, um, all inclusive, not just ours, really serve the purpose of, as you can say, save the world. We knew 
first weekend in January when we were waiting, that having that sequence, knowing that it was a SARS virus, we were gonna be able to move quickly and we were gonna be able to move with confidence because it doesn't take much for us. One of the benefits of our platform is that we can look at those letters, understand what we've done in the past. We have people in the team who couldn't wait until that sequence was made available and they immediately saw the opportunity, what to use in our vaccine, what to target. The fact that the virus is more stable, that makes it a more easy target for vaccine development. For a vaccine trial to work, there does have to be natural exposure to the illness. That does mean that there is the opportunity to find out if these vaccines work. We have a population that has no immunity. That, has, that makes a perfect window for demonstration of a vaccine. We're vaccinologists, you know, that's kind of a nerdy thing to say. When I say to people, oh, I'm a vaccinologist, they're what is that? All right, but this is our moment because we have a skill set and a vision of what can happen that no one has. And we know we can fix this problem. As vaccine developers, uh, for us it's important to remain um, very transparent and uh, inform about the data uh, we see in our trials. There's a lot of data about how reluctant will people be uh, to take the vaccine. You know, we're going to have to have voices who are trusted speak out about this and continue to be open about the data. What I want people to understand is that the safety and the development of these vaccines is not any different than what has been happening before. The requirements from um, the FDA are actually more robust than they have been before. I also understand that there are um, uh, issues of lack of trustworthiness. And I say it in that way because understanding that the onus of gaining the public's trust lies in the hands of people like me from the vaccine development standpoint and the institutions where um, I, I am employed, for example, to earn trust that has been stripped from people um, over the course of centuries. I wanted to make it clear that the work that we've been doing for so long, I personally, I stand by it. With, with essentially all of my being. I think for many it feels as though we're at the end, we're towards authorization and that is a, is a milestone, but it's not about that. It's about the next eight months too of making sure we're distributing that vaccine and people feel confident enough to take it. Um, if, if people don't have confidence in our vaccine, then there was no point to, to developing it. So we need to make sure that we actually get to the true finish line uh, and then maybe I'll have a moment to step back and think about what I've, I've done and what our team has done and what our company has done. But for now, we are still so in the middle of it that it's hard to see what's on the other side. Can you all hear me? That was that was a nice one. Uh, give me one second and we'll start with the presentations, okay?
Okay, guys, after some technical difficulties, we are back. And Dara, I'll hand over the stage to you. Okay, thank you. So just to give you guys an update on this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so globally, as of the 5th of February 2021, there have been over one, 100 and 4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including 2 million deaths reported to the World Health Organization. Uh, change. Please. Yep. Thank you. So as you know that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is caused by this severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, which is a positive uh, stance, single-stranded RNA virus, and the SARS COV2 genome encodes multiple structural and non-structural proteins, as you can see in this slide. Uh, the structural proteins include the spike protein, the enveloped membrane nucleocapsid proteins. And the structure of the viral spike protein was published in Science back in February 2020. And the spike protein has been shown to be the site of binding to the ACE2 receptor, which is of interest as a potential target for neutralizing antibodies, for example. Change, please, uh, please Tanu. So the development of vaccine was initiated uh, when the genetic sequence of the virus became available uh, early in early January, 2020, and has moved uh, at an unprecedented speed with the phase one trial started in March, 2020. So currently considerable efforts have been put into developing effective and safe vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 the traditional vaccine development, however, as you can see in this slide, uh, can take up to 15 years or more, starting with a lengthy discovery process, discovery phase in which vaccine are designed and preclinical experiments are conducted, and the vaccine candidate then enter phase one and two and uh, three trials. So when phase three uh, trials are completed, finally the vaccine is licensed, and after that point, large-scale production begins. The vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2, however, is following quite an extra limited timeline because the knowledge of uh, that, 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 that was gained from the initial development of the vaccines for the SARS coronavirus and the MERS coronavirus, and the, the discovery phase was omitted. Existing processes were adopted and phase one and two trials were started. The phase three trials were initiated after the interim analysis of phase one and two results. And in the meantime, the vaccine producers have started the large scale production and several vaccine candidates uh, for several vaccine candidates. And for the next 15 minutes also, we're going to be talking about uh, the three of them in detail. Uh, next please, Tanu. Mm -hmm. So as of uh, December uh, last year, there are over 200 vaccine candidates for COVID-19 being developed. And of these, at least 52 of them are in human trials right now. So there are mainly four types of, of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that are currently uh, being developed. The first one is the whole pathogen vaccines, which can be divided into the inactivated vaccine and the live attenuated vaccine. For the inactivated vaccine, uh, they take the disease carrying virus and uh, inactivate or kill it using chemicals, heat or radiation and this has been, uh, this approach uses technology which, which uh, that's been proven to work in human. And this was the way that uh, uh, vaccines such as the flu vaccine or polio vaccines are made. The second one is the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the life attenuated vaccine, uh, which uses a living, but the weakened version of the virus and one of that is very similar to the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine or the MMR vaccine. And, but however, this vaccine is, uh, may not be suitable for people with compromised immune system. The second type of vaccine that are being developed is the viral vector vaccines. And this type of vaccine uses a safe virus to deliver specific subparts such as the uh, proteins, uh, of interest that can trigger immune response and immune response without causing the disease. And which can be divided into replicating viral vector uh, and the non-replicating viral vector such as adenovirus. The third type is the protein-based vaccine which can be divided into subunit vaccine and viral-like particle. 
And for the subunit drug scene is uh, the one that only uses a specific parts or the subunits of the virus that can trigger the immune response that the immune system needs to recognize, but it doesn't contain the whole virus or use a safe virus as a vector. And this subunit can be uh, proteins such as the uh, spike protein or the membrane protein, for example. And the last one is the nucleic acid vaccines, which are DNA vaccine and RNA vaccine. And this nucleic acid vaccine delivers a specific set of instructions to our cells, either DNA or mRNA, for them to make the specific proteins that we want our immune system to recognize and respond to. Tanya, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I wanted to explain a little about the clinical trial and its phases. Uh, generally, clinical trials are divided into phase one, phase two, and phase three. But because of the time limit and the pandemic situation for this case, it generally was divided into either phase one and phase two plus three, or phase one plus two and then phase three, so that the time taken is, is shorter. So the primary goal for phase one or two trial is to evaluate the short-term safety, the dosage, and the reactogenicity. Reactogenicity is the body's uh, reaction to the vaccine, which may include two things, either localized symptoms, such as pain, redness, swelling, or number two, systemic symptoms, such as fever or headache. Uh, although they are called side effects, they are actually good because they, these symptoms is a sign that our body is generating an immune system against the virus. So if you're feeling a little pain after the vaccine, do not curse the vaccine. It means that the vaccine is working in your, inside your body and your body is recognizing that and acting accordingly. Uh, so what the investigators are actually checking for in this part of the trial is the correct dosage. And they're actually checking whether the vaccine leads to any other more serious effects or not. The second goal is to understand the immunogenicity, if it can induce a detectable immune response against the target, that is the SARS-CoV-2 in this case. The best vaccines are known to create memory responses and neutralizing antibodies. Finally, if the vaccine successfully completes phase one and phase two of the trial, it goes for a large scale phase three, which includes people of diverse age, sex, race, ethnicity, baseline body mass index, and the presence of coexisting condition. So this one generally includes people from all background and uh, environment and bodily natures, and then tests whether the approved vaccine which worked in phase one or two is now working in a far greater population or not. Now we'll go forward and Maria will start with her part. So hi, uh, my name is Maria, and uh, I will tell you a bit more about Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, so uh, first, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, okay, it's working. Uh, so first I want to tell you how uh, the vaccine uh, was constructed. So uh, in this type of vaccine, they use, um, especially made uh, years ago, uh, replication deficient chimpanzee adenoviral vector uh, called, uh, I will call it uh, Chadox one because it's easier to say. Um, so it was uh, previously developed as a um, vaccine platform. 
uh, and uh, this vector contains uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, structural surface glycoprotein uh, antigen, so spike protein gene, along with uh, tissue uh, plasminogen uh, activator leader sequence. Um, the vector uh, itself has already been used in uh, MERS vaccine uh, and, as I said, uh, was investigated as a potential uh, vaccine platform uh, for other uh, diseases. And, you know, it's like a readily made to just load it with uh, appropriate uh, gene for the disease uh, we are uh, vaccinating. Uh, you may wonder why they decided to use uh, simian adenovirus instead of human. Uh, that's because um, human adenovirus are quite uh, common uh, among humans. So uh, using um, the human virus may um, cause some dangerous uh, and serious responses. Uh, and the risk with uh, simian adenovirus is um, much lower. Uh, okay, so uh, it is a little bit different from Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccine, which use uh, lipid nanoparticles with uh, the same gene, probably a different sequence, but uh, generally the gene coding for the same uh, protein. Uh, so how does this type of vaccine work? Uh, because it's a little bit different. Uh, we have uh, mRNA, so a special instruction how to make proteins. So generally when a person is vaccinated, mm, the uh, antigen presenting cells uh, take up uh, the um, mRNA that is uh, in this viruses or nano lipid nanoparticles and then they uh, transcribe it to make a uh, spike protein uh, and they uh, present it on their surface um, to um, T cells and then T cells get activated and um, the, the whole um, response uh, is um, the um, effect our T cells and, and plasma cells are um, uh, are effect, uh, well, they are um, producing special factors, including antigens and cytokines, and generally our immune system um, does everything to uh, uh, to uh, get rid of the potential pathogen. And of course, uh, it would not make no sense if uh, memory I wasn't uh, made during this process. So, of course, uh, memory T and B cells are uh, produced. Uh, Maria, can I add something here? Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the cool things about having an mRNA delivered is that it also acts as a PAMP. And they, especially dendritic cells, they like to uh, see things in context. So if they see an mRNA... Uh, mRNA itself is a da it's a danger signal. It's a signal that something's not going wrong. So when uh, antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells receive mRNA, they go through maturation, which allows them to present their antigens even more. In fact, in absence of PAMPs, it is very hard to get a good immune response. So I feel like this mRNA is, is doing twofold job. It's transcribing for the viral protein as well as providing the danger signal. Yeah, but this one is the um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, right? So that's mm -hmm. not the mRNA one. So um, Maria, can you tell us if they have any do they have any adjuvants included in this uh, preparation, or did they just give the adenovirus mm. with the sequence? Uh, no, I think it's just. I don't know virus. I okay. mean, uh, they. I, I feel like Astra uh, Zeneca vaccine has much less adverse responses than uh, Pfizer and Moderna. So I'm actually not sure if they use any adjuvant. Okay. Hmm. Then I just was talking about generally. Then in that case, not about this vaccine. Okay. So. Uh, Oh, something's wrong. Okay. 
oh no, something happened bad in my presentation, sorry. Okay, now I think it's working. So, uh, okay, generally uh, in the article that um, I based my presentation on, um, they were referring to uh, four um, studies, four clinical trials uh, that were conducted in, uh, in a few countries. So uh, those were uh, the study one, two, three, and five. And here are a few informations about every study. So the first study was um, the phase one, two study. It included around 1,000 uh, people, healthy people. Uh, they were aged from 18 to 55. They were uh, divided equally um, into um, the experimental part and control part. Uh, the control uh, vaccine used was a meningitis vaccine. The participants received one or two doses. And um, to tell you more, um, there were some like strange things going on with these uh, studies, to be honest, because they, um, they introduced um, the second dose quite long after the study started. Uh, and it had influence on other uh, clinical trials too. Uh, the study started in April and it was conducted in UK. Um, the second study uh, was the phase two free study. It included uh, over 10,000 people, also uh, people with some comorbidities and uh, comorbidities and also healthcare workers, so people at risk. It included uh, people over 18 years, but uh, people over uh, 60 years old, there, there were many of them. So those were also mostly 18 to 55 years. Uh, and again, people were uh, divided equally into control and experimental part. Mm, the control uh, agent was again a meningitis vaccine. The participants um, received two doses. Um, but um, as I told you, uh, because the first study was a, a little bit uh, messy to me, um, they uh, received uh, two different dosing strategies. So um, they could get uh, two standard doses or one low dose and one standard dose. So remember this because it will uh, be, um, I will be talking about it when uh, I will get to the efficacy uh, section. Uh, the study uh, began in May and it was conducted in UK. Uh, the first study was uh, the um, phase three study. Uh, it also included over uh, 10,000, well, around 10,000 people and also people with uh, comorbidities and uh, healthcare workers. Um, also, the age structure was similar. People were also divided equally, but they, uh, the control part uh, received uh, either a meningitis vaccine or a saline, and they received two uh, doses, only standard doses, and so uh, no group with uh, low and standard dose. It began in June and it was conducted in Brazil. And the last one um, uh, started in also in June and uh, it was a, a first and second phase of study. Uh, it included around 2000 people aged from 18 to 65 years old. Um, the control group received uh, saline. Um, they also got two doses and uh, it was conducted in South Africa, and out of those four studies, uh, this was the only one that was uh, double blind, which also raises some questions to me. Uh, okay, so uh, the safety information was um, drawn from uh, all four studies, but the efficacy conclusions only from uh, the second and the third study, because um, there were more participants in this one. Okay, so um, during, uh, well, during and after these studies, because they are actually um, still uh, going on, 
um, when they were analyzing efficacy and uh, safety, they, um, they had to somehow include and exclude people. So generally exclusion criteria uh, for, uh, for recruiting people was if they received this, um, uh, this vector, this Chadox vector before, maybe in some other vaccine. Um, and also, um, if they received both low dosage, uh, so in the first and second dose, if the, uh, the dose was low, uh, they weren't uh, included in the final efficacy, um, efficacy analy analysis. Uh, also, if the baseline seropositivity was unavailable or it, it was positive, they were also excluded. If there were some errors in vaccination, um, also if, uh, for example, uh, they dropped out and there was less than 15 days of follow-up after the second dose, if they didn't receive the second dose, uh, if the participant, for example, resigned, or um, if the uh, PCR test was positive 14 days after the second dose. Of course, they also had to analyze medical history, uh, some uh, vital signs. Mm, they collected serum for um, SARS-CoV-2 serology. Um, the participants had to assess uh, their own symptoms. Uh, in one study, participants had weekly self swabs. And uh, also additional COVID-19 tests were also included in the analysis. So for example, if the, the, um, the employer um, had some tests uh, for, uh, for employees, they were also included. Uh, okay, so here I will present you the results. Uh, first, uh, I want to concentrate on the safety. So this is uh, this SAER serious adverse event. And there were uh, 169 uh, overall uh, events out of around 12,000 people. Uh, so 79 were in uh, control, uh, in uh, experimental group and 89 in control. So uh, it was a very low uh, rate of this serious adverse, adverse event, so less than 1%. Um, then uh, they assessed uh, adverse events of special interest, and it was a little bit uh, more because it was 95 in experimental group and 126 in control. But out of those uh, adverse uh, serious and uh, adverse events and adverse events of special interest, only three were possibly related to uh, vaccine or, or control um, agent. But in the end, only one uh, was confirmed to be possibly related because the other two turned out to be connected to unknown disease that um, the participant had previously. For example, one participant had multiple sclerosis, uh, which was revealed during the study. Uh, Maria, can you mention again, uh, what is AES, AESI again? What does that mean? Adverse event of special interest. So it's not serious, but uh, they put some, um, you know, some pressure on it that it may be important. That uh, it, it's not very serious. Like for example, it's not transverse myelitis, but still maybe maybe quite dangerous if not. Okay. Care. And this control was the meningitis vaccine that is approved, right? Yeah, or saline in uh, some of Brazil participants. Okay, so and it looks in... like it's it's actually safer than an approved vaccine if you just look at the safety data. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so very important for us now is uh, the subject of how to calculate efficacy of the vaccine. So we take the risk of the disease among unvaccinated groups. So it is basically calculated as the rate um, of 
people who actually got the disease out of all people in this group, uh, minus the risk among vaccinated group, which is calculated in the same way. And it is all divided um, by risk among unvaccinated group, or my, uh, one minus a risk ratio. Okay. Uh, so um, let's now talk about the efficacy of the uh, of the vaccine. Uh, so um, in the end, uh, a little bit over eleven thousand participants were um, included uh, in this primary analysis of efficacy. Those were uh, from uh, the second and third um, study, uh, and. Um, 5,800 around uh, received two doses of uh, the experimental vaccine and 5,800 uh, received um, two doses of control product. So what I want to concentrate on is there might be a little bias because as you can see, um, the division between sex is not equal. So there are more women, even though men seem to be more prone to severe COVID. And uh, what I think and what the author said is that um, it might be because they concentrated on recruiting healthcare workers. And these are mostly women. And also there is a huge bias in ethnicity a study in, uh, especially in this second uh, second uh, study. And in the third, it, it's lower because it was also conducted in Brazil. So probably the ethnical, um, ethnical well, diversity is, is greater there. But still there are mostly um, white, uh, white people included in the, in the study. Um, so, the overall efficacy uh, was around 70%. So it was pulled for all the recipients in uh, those two studies who, of course, met the inclusion criteria. But if we look in detail, uh, we can see that there are huge differences between uh, those who received uh, low dose and standard dose and those who received do uh, the two standard doses. So it's like very huge difference. Also, uh, there is a little bit uh, of difference between uh, the study in UK and in Brazil and uh, all who received um, standard doses uh, were gener had generally uh, lower, uh, lower efficacy. So uh, what's also quite interesting is that um, the vaccine is quite effective if we assess symptomatic COVID-19. But if we assess asymptomatic or for symptoms that are unknown, uh, the vaccine efficacy drops. So we can say that the vaccine is quite effective at preventing um, the full COVID-19 disease, but it's not effective at uh, general positive cases, preventing general positive cases. Uh, so uh, as we can again see, the difference between low dose, standard dose, and both standard doses was uh, significant. And uh, also, if we uh, assess um, the same difference, but with longer interval between vaccine doses, so over eight weeks, this difference is slower. It's, it's not significant, but uh, it's very close. But still, I think that uh, this, maybe this longer uh, interval may be uh, beneficial. Uh, for standard dose, the interval itself wasn't uh, very, um, well, the, the difference between intervals wasn't significant. So if we decide to, uh, 
to uh, actually make this uh, standard dose more effective, so closer to uh, to low dose, um, we could actually uh, use longer interval. Um, okay, so this is the efficacy 21 days after only one dose. So uh, it's not two doses, but after one dose. And as we can see, uh, this efficacy is uh, generally it's uh, lower for UK, a bit higher for, for Brazil. Uh, but yeah, we can actually compare it here. Um, so uh, it's also lower for asymptomatic, uh, symptomatic, and uh, well, generally uh, other uh, other pooled uh, cases. So if we pool all the cases, then one dose is less effective. But as we can see in Brazil study, it's actually more effective, and. Um, one of the reasons might be that the control group in Brazil was a little bit different because they used two different control agents. They used saline or meningitis vaccine. And this may be the reason, uh, because as you can see, the uh, control rate percent is a little bit different. So this may be the reason why uh, this percentage is actually different. But you know, that's only uh, my idea about it. Mm, to see this efficacy much clearer, um, we can use this type of uh, chart, which actually compares uh, this efficacy in longer time periods. So on uh, X uh, axis, we have days in second dose. And here we have the uh, proportion of uh, participants who had a risk of, um, of contracting the disease. So as we can see here, after two doses, uh, the vaccine is effective. This experimental vaccine is effective at preventing COVID-19. Uh, after only one dose, it's also effective, but this efficacy is lower, as we can see. Um, so they also assess the hospitalization rate uh, for uh, both control and experimental group. And as we can see, there were only two people hospitalized in the um, experimental group, which shows that uh, this vaccine is both safe and uh, that it's effective at preventing severe uh, COVID-19. Um, okay, and these two cases were actually not entirely connected to the vaccine because the first one was on the um, day of first vaccination, vaccination, so it may or may not be connected to the vaccine, uh, and the other one was 10 days after first dose, which may be somehow connected, but uh, it may be a little bit uh, also and different. Uh, okay, so all those uh, results raise some questions. So the first question is, uh, what about uh, people over uh, 55 years? Uh, well, actually they were not included in the efficacy analysis, analysis because there were too little of them uh, because um, they didn't include them in uh, one of the studies and the other, uh, they included only just some of them. So uh, it was not possible to, um, to raise any conclusions out of that. Uh, and actually last week in Europe, there were some doubts whether to vaccinate people over 60 years of age with AstraZeneca vaccine uh, because of insufficient data. So, well, to underline this, this vaccine may be effective for people over 60 years or may not. There is a very little data about it. So um, the European countries decided to just wait for some more information. 
Uh, there is also, uh, as I told you, uh, this case with more females. So uh, as I told you, they focus more on healthcare workers, which are mostly females. Uh, one may ask one, why there are no children in the studies, and um, there is a very simple answer. It's money. Uh, it's usually uh, much more uh, costly to include children in the studies. Uh, there was also a different time gap, so they didn't actually have this uh, specialized time gap, for example, in you know, three weeks or six weeks, they gave this second dose differently in different people. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a bit uh, doubtful um, because, you know, the study design was, wasn't really good for me. Um, and also, um, why? Mm, there was higher e efficacy in low dose standard dose group. Uh, one of the reasons oh, sorry, uh, must be that um, uh, there were higher levels of uh, neutralizing antibody after uh, the first uh, low dose, uh, or maybe lower levels of anti vector uh, immunity, uh, or maybe differential antibody functionality. So uh, one of the first things that came to my mind was that uh, if you give too much antigen, it may actually provoke uh, tolerance in the body. So, for example, when we uh, eat, uh, we eat usually a lot of food. So our organism learns not to um, respond to, to food antigen. So maybe this might be the reason why low dose is better Actually, there is uh, very little um, information about it, so I think we need to wait for for some more uh, studies on how. Uh... I have one more guess about that. Yeah. Um, another thing with low dose versus high dose uh, vaccination is that the B cells, when there is a low dose of antigen, the B cells get through go through a more rigorous round of selection uh, in the germinal center. So only the best ones get selected. But when there's a higher dose of the antigen, even those B cells that are not as good, they will get selected because there is plenty of antigens available. So that could be one reason. I'm just guessing. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so to conclude, um, the uh, efficacy, pooled efficacy after two doses were around uh, 70%. After one dose, only 64%. So if you get vaccinated with this vaccine, be sure to get two doses. Uh, the vaccine is very safe as there were no, uh, not many serious adverse events or adverse events of special interest. Um, the vaccine may not be as uh, efficient as uh, Pfizer or a Moderna vaccine, but it meets minimal requirements uh, of uh, World Health Organization. Uh, and it may be enough to reduce restrictions like social distancing. And also uh, it's great with storage because you can store it in normal refrigerator. It doesn't need freezing in very low temperatures. And actually, I want to tell you about some new information because uh, there is a preprint uh, preprint in uh, Lancet. So they um, they think that the longer time gap over 12 weeks before, between the doses increase the efficacy to 82%. So it may actually be beneficial to wait like three months before getting uh, the second dose. And also it is suspected that this vaccine uh, may reduce transmission. So it may not be effective at preventing um, asymptomatic COVID, but it may reduce transmission. But um, yeah, this is all only a preprint. So we need to, we need, we need to wait uh, for the peer review, but it's quite, um, quite interesting for me. And uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Good one, Maria. 
Uh, who's going next? Danu, if you're saying something, you're muted. Sorry, it's yeah. me. I'm just <laughs> requesting the remote control from. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was gonna say that because you're remote controlling me, uh, if you're muting me, I cannot stop yeah. it and ask questions. Uh, so I had some questions for Mar Maria, but it's fine. I can ask her later. And uh, yeah, now I'm giving it to you, Samriti. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you, Maria, for that uh, presentation. And um, today I'm going to talk about the Moderna vaccine trials. Uh, so the Moderna vaccine, which is also called mRNA, uh, 1273 is really quite simplistic, actually, and it's made up of only a couple of components. Um, and like Jatin mentioned, there, it doesn't really need an adjuvant because, you know, we know that adjuvants are quite common for a lot of vaccine formulations. Um, but this one doesn't really require that. So really, the main component of this vaccine are, of course, the mRNA that is encoding for the spike protein, which is the antigen. And this mRNA is encapsulated by um, a variety of lipids and proteins, and they serve a couple of key functions. So there is an mRNA stabilizing lipid that's called SM102, and there are some structural components like um, DMG, PEG, and DS DSPC, as well as cholesterol. So apart from them being these stabilizing agents, they're also helping to improve the circulation of this nanoparticle, and then fusing with cells once it enters the body. And then finally, there are some sugars and salts, and that's pretty much it. So it's not a very complicated formulation. Wait, you say sugars and salts almost makes me feel, feel like it's you're make, cooking something. <laughs> like the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now mRNA on their own don't really do anything. The vaccine really requires the body to translate this mRNA sequence into a protein. And it's the protein that is priming our immune response. So this vaccine is given intramuscularly and works to prime the immune system in a couple of different ways. So the first way is that the lipid nanoparticle can directly enter muscle cells. And this is shown in the top panel. And this is where the ribosomes are translating that mRNA into a spike protein, which is the actual viral antigen. This antigen can then be secreted into the circulation or it's cleaved in the cell and presented to MHC class one. And the second way is that the lipid nanoparticle can enter um, antigen presenting cells. And this is shown in the bottom panel. And this is where, again, the spike protein is translated and presented to MHC one to prime CD8 T cells. But even more importantly is that the circulating spike protein can be taken up by these antigen presenting cells and be presented to MHC2. And MHC2 is priming the CD4 T cells and the B cells, which are the um, antibody generating cells. So there's a great study uh, published in 2017, and it was published in Molecular Therapy by Moderna that looked at this mechanism of action of their mRNA vaccines. And the study was done with an influenza vaccine in non-human primates, and they found that the vaccine induced antigen specific C4 positive T cells and that the lipid nanoparticle was draining to the lymph nodes. Um, so in the lymph nodes, the mRNA was being translated mainly by the DCs and monocytes and their prophylactic treatment was leading to the generation of a very strong uh, vaccine specific immunity. Uh, so I just have one a very general question if any of you know, uh, why do we always give shots in the muscles? I honestly don't know why why can't we do subcutaneous or anything else? I think doing sub Q is a little bit more difficult. It might require a little bit more training. I'm not I'm honestly not entirely sure. So are are you saying that both could be as yeah, good? Giving, uh, giving subcutaneous injections is just it's more focused. 
like well, I observed my sister uh, during during some uh, subcutaneous injections, and it was like you know very slow, and intramuscular are very fast. So yeah, I think that that. Okay. So it's just convenience. Is that what you're saying? I think so. Okay. And then the IV route has completely different, um, you know, issues with that, depending on you know where the uh, the vector is ending up, and I think muscle just a little bit easier to do. Um, so now to uh, test their effective dose, their safety and efficacy of the vaccine in preventing the disease, they performed uh, two key phases of testing um, called phase one and phase three. Uh, their phase one was a dose escalation study that looked mostly at overall safety of the vaccine. And they also tested you know, various um, doses to really determine which dose uh, causes which side effects and which one is the most efficacious. Uh, there were 45 people that were recruited for their phase one study and they were equally divided into three dose testing groups. And they were monitored for adverse reactions and their immune response, uh, mostly in the form of antibody titers and antibody neutralizing ability. And this, this study essentially concluded that the 100 microgram dose is kind of the sweet spot where the adverse reactions are tolerable, but also uh, enough to induce very good immune responses. And so with this information, they performed their big phase three clinical trial where they looked at the actual ability of this vaccine to prevent infection. So for this study, they recruited almost 30,000 people and they divided them equally into um, placebo and treatment groups. They recruited anyone uh, over the age of 18 and they actually had quite a number of people that were in the uh, 65 and older age group. And they gave the treatment group two doses of the 100 microgram dose, 28 days apart, and then measured them for safety and efficacy. Okay, so what uh, exactly does the safety and efficacy really mean in the context of their study? Well, there are four uh, indications that they looked at to determine their safety profile. So the first is a solicited or an anticipated adverse reaction. This could be either local or systemic. A local reaction would be something like having pain at the injection site, and a systemic reaction would be something that happens away from the injection site, and this could be anything that really affects your body, um, like getting a headache or a fever. They also looked at uh, unsolicited adverse reactions, which is anything that would not really be typical, a typical reaction for a vaccine. And then the most serious indications are an adverse um, event that would lead to the person discontinuing from the study or anything uh, that's a really serious adverse event like hospitalization or death. And then to assess efficacy, they looked at two indications. The first is the ability of the treatment to prevent a first time infection of that person with COVID-19 at least 14 days after they receive their second dose. And to be able to qualify as being positive for COVID, the participant would have to have at least two cold-like symptoms like having a cough or a fever or one respiratory symptom like trouble breathing, but they had to also be positive um, for SARS-CoV-2 by the PCR test. Their second indication was the ability of the treatment to actually prevent severe COVID disease. So among all of the people in the placebo and the treatment to get COVID-19, how many of them have a really serious disease that would lead them to being on oxygen or having organ failure and which group are they from? So this is, I think, very important because you know, as we know, vaccines aren't perfect. And although it's really important for them to um, be able to prevent you from getting the disease in the first place, it is also really important for them to be able to reduce at least uh, the number of people getting very, very sick. And this is going to be very important for decreasing the burden on our uh, healthcare systems. So in this study, they did have some very uh, key exclusion criteria, which would deem you to be a poor candidate for being in the trial. And this included being pregnant or having had COVID before or having it at the time of recruitment, 
uh, being immunosuppressed or if you have any known history of anaphylaxis to vaccines. So I am not going to spend too much time explaining exactly what happened throughout the trial, but this is just a general overview showing us that they started off with 15,210 participants in the vaccine and the placebo groups each. And many of them did uh, make it through to receiving both doses of the vaccine, but some people uh, discontinued or there were errors in delivery or issues with timeline. And this is you know, quite common for clinical trials, but in the end, there were 14,134 people who were evaluated for efficacy um, in the vaccine group and 14,073 in the placebo group. So I'll first uh, discuss the safety results. So the figure here is showing the percentage of participants who had a local reaction after receiving either the placebo, one or two doses, or the vaccine, again, one or two doses. So the grading shows the severity of the uh, side effects with grade one being very mild and grade three being um, severe. So what we see here is that a greater percentage of participants in the vaccine group had adverse reactions than those in the placebo group. And a majority of these participants were experiencing um, grade one pain at the injection site. Erythema, which is uh, redness or a rash was less common and as was swelling or swelling of the lymph nodes. Uh, these effects were much more pronounced after the second vaccine dose. Here they're showing the same type of figure, but instead of showing systemic reactions to, but instead they're showing systemic uh, reactions to both the, to either the placebo or the vaccine. And again, a greater percentage of people in the vaccine group had adverse reactions than in the placebo. And the most common systemic side effects were headache, fatigue, and muscle pains. And again, a majority of these patients um, that had these reactions um, had them after two doses of the vaccine. Again, most people are experiencing grade one side effects, but there were about 15 people uh, that were experiencing uh, overall uh, adverse events that were grade three. So in summary, there were solicited, um, there were more solicited reactions in the vaccine group versus the control, with the most common reaction being injection at the at the um, uh, pain at the site of injection, uh, headaches and fatigue. So to me, this is not entirely surprising. I mean, given that the vaccine is trying to generate an immune response, and this is a very like dynamic process, and it's known to cause these side effects. But you know, a majority of these symptoms um, did, sub did subside after an average of about three days though. So now we'll discuss the efficacy uh, data. Sorry, I have one comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because the, uh, these adverse events are actually similar as for flu vaccine. So yeah, I think that these are not yeah. so serious and actually um, not, very, not of much concern yeah, I think they're tolerable. Um, so yeah, the efficacy data is, to me, the most exciting part of this study. And this graph does have a lot of information here. So I'll first talk about the various aspects of the, gra of the graph to kind of um, guide you in its interpretation. So on the x-axis here, we have the number of days since this study started, essentially. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative event rate, which is a measure of the percentage of people who are developing a certain outcome. So in this case, it's uh, COVID. These two arrows are showing when the first and second doses of the vaccine were given. And at the top here, they're showing a summary of the results. So the vaccine efficacy of the mRNA uh, vaccine here is 93%, but it does have a range of error. So it's really anywhere between 88.9 and 95.6%. The incidence rate per 1000 person years is on the right to that on the right of that. And what this um, really means, essentially, is that if we were to follow 1000 people in America, because you know, America is where this study was done, uh, if we were to follow these people for a year, we would expect that 80 people in the placebo group and about six people in the vaccine group would get COVID. So overall, what we're really seeing here is that when observed for up to 120 days, 
participants who received the COVID vaccine had a lower cumulative rate of infection than those who got placebo, indicating that it is having a protective effect in the vaccine group. They also broke down the vaccine efficacy in terms of different subgroups, and it shows some key things here. One of them is that um, people between the ages of 18 and 65 years old had a higher vaccine efficacy rate than those that were older than 65, but the protection in the latter group is still very good. Um, sex does not really seem to significantly change the efficacy outcomes and neither does race, race or ethnicity. So people, um, they also looked at people who are at risk for severe COVID, like those that have um, other comorbidities and they were still benefiting from a very good uh, vaccine efficacy. So the long story short here is that over the 120 days of the study, 185 people in the placebo and 11 people in the vaccine group developed COVID. All of the severe cases were in the placebo group and the level of prevention of COVID in the vaccine groups was consistent across uh, a lot of different subgroups like age, uh, sex, ethnicity, and comorbidities. You know, but I do have to say that there were quite a number of limitations to the study. And I think it's really with time that um, they'll be able to tackle these problems. Uh, the first is that they are only really assessing the efficacy outcomes after two doses. So they do make a mention in their study that it was not designed to assess the efficacy of just one dose of the vaccine. So whether one dose is protective enough or not, we don't really know yet, um, and they did not test for that. The second is that the results of the study published here were from a very short period of time, about three months. Uh, but, you know, of course, this is a developing situation and they are continuing to monitor these participants even now, and they're going to continue to do so for about two years. So hopefully we'll get even more data in the future from this study. And we have to remember that in this study, they're looking at whether the vaccine can prevent someone from getting COVID, but they tested it in a real world setting of social distancing and mask wearing. So even though they included healthcare workers in the study who would be at risk, a majority of them were not healthcare workers. So now of course, whether or not we can actually give the, vac the vaccine group SARS-CoV-2 is more of an ethical dilemma. And this was, I think, discussed at length uh, last summer, um, but in this study, they, they did not do that. And I honestly think uh, one of the major flaws of this study is that they did not look at asymptomatic infection. And I think that looking at that at this parameter is really important because it would start to answer some questions about viral shedding. And if, if, you know, if you're vaccinated, can you still pass the virus on to someone else um, if you end up being somehow asymptomatically infected? And we don't really have the answers for this right now, but I think for the short term, this is not really a hindrance for us being able to reduce the healthcare system burden of this disease. Um, so this may be something that would be important later on once we have you know, a, a really strong grasp on the disease. They also did not look at pregnant women or children in the study, which are an important group. And it does go back to the whole asymptomatic infection question um, because we know that kids generally don't experience severe COVID. And finally, right now, there is not really any correlate of protection for any COVID vaccine study. So this is not just a limitation for this study, uh, but for all of the vaccine candidates. So right now, we don't really have an answer as to, you know, for example, what antibody titer would be, um, what antibody titer would be enough to ensure protection from COVID. So the only real measure we have is that the number of people who do or don't get infected. But again, this is probably something that I think the scientific community is exploring and we'll probably know more about it um, with time. So with that, I'm going to conclude the Moderna vaccine study and pass it on to Tanu. So for the question about why it is given to the muscles and uh, not anywhere else, there have been multiple studies already comparing the vaccine effects on different types of tissues. If you give it to in the muscle tissues, it is seen to have the optimum immunogenicity while having the minimum of any 
adverse effects or side effects. And uh, if they give it in the fatty acid tissues, it, most of the time it has been seen that the vaccine, uh, the content of the vaccine just remains there instead of properly spreading it throughout the body. And if you give it uh, intra, intramuscularly, sorry, intravenously, it has been seen that the seroconversion level is low and there is higher decay of the vaccine, of the antibodies against the vaccine. So the administration via muscle has been seen to be perfect. I wonder if, um, just a second, I wonder if the muscles are also helping to disperse the antigen, just like how the lymphoid, the lymph, uh, fluids are moved around by the muscle movement yeah i think it is uh i think it's speculated that the muscle is producing the protein from the mrna and the, the protein is um you know being put into circulation by the muscles so that's also serving as a source of antigen okay then your uh, screen is not being shared yeah i'm trying that I feel after the mRNA vaccines, these things are going to become the norm. They'll replace. It also feels, seems like they are easier to produce. I attended a talk by the uh, some guy, I think some scientist from Moderna, and he was talking about how little uh, how little equipment they need compared to the production of giant proteins for which they need cell cultures and all those thousand liter reactors for this they just need a an equipment big enough that could be fit inside any of our labs so it's pretty useful in for any every sense saves money as well yeah i know mrna vaccines have not been used very much in the past so this studies really are providing a pioneer to more mrna based vaccines mm -hmm. Okay, can I start? Can everyone yeah. see the screen? It's okay, you see it. Yep. Um, so hi, I'm Tanu. I'll be presenting more about the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine, which is the BNT162B2. So Pfizer and BioNTech coordinated to test four vaccines out of which two went forward to clinical trial one. And finally, the BNT162B2 was the vaccine which was used for clinical trials three and two and three and now is in the market. Let's learn a little bit about the two vaccines which went for clinical trial one so that we know uh, on what basis the scientists thought that one vaccine is better than the other one. BNT162B1 is a messenger RNA, but inside a lipid nanoparticle. And this messenger RNA basically codes for a receptor binding domain of spike protein. Spike protein is the most immunogenic part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it codes for the receptor binding domain uh, against which most neutralizing antibodies can be formed. But receptor binding domain by itself is not immunogenic in a human body. So what they did was they added the uh, T4 fibrating fold on domain, which is basically a T4 phage head domain. Uh, and it increases the immunogenicity by making this content of the vaccine multivalent. This lipid nanoparticles can be taken up by our human cells, releasing the mRNA, which will be coding for the RBD, receptor binding domain region of the spike protein and does help uh, leading to immune response from our body. The second vaccine which went into clinical trial one was BNT162B2, which is 
also a mRNA inside a lipid nanoparticle, but this time this messenger RNA encodes for the full length spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this mRNA was also modified with two pro proline mutations. And this mutation specifically locks the spike protein into a conformation, which can best induce neutralizing antibody production without undergoing multiple mutations or variations in the spike protein. There were two phases of the study. One small phase was the phase one with a smaller group of people. And then the phase two and three was done together with a larger and more diverse group. Uh, Tanu, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Is this the proline substitution where it differs from the Moderna vaccine? Or is it also the formulation in which the mRNA is resolved? Uh, uh, I know that the Moderna one is also in the pre-fusion uh, pre spike protein context. I'm not, I don't remember exactly what mutation they have in theirs. Okay. It's the same. Uh, I don't know whether exact same proline was mutated, but it, the aim was the same to make it a prefusion and mm -hmm. uh, more stable, which will have better antibody, neutralizing antibody. Yeah, they're very reaction. similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the phase one, there were 195 people and uh, it was in the age group of 18 to 55. And then there was another age group of 65 to 85. So uh, I don't know why or how, but multiple people studied out the BNT162B1 vaccine. And there was one study which compared the BNT162B1 with BNT162B2 study, which I'll be talking more about. And then they didn't do a one-to-one -one ratio. Again, I don't know why they did a four-to-one ratio where four, uh, four, four fraction of the people or the participants got the vaccine and only one fraction got the placebo. There were multiple doses tried out, 10 micrograms, 20, 30, and 100 micrograms. The, 10, 20, and 30 were given in two doses, but the 100 microgram, because it was very more reactogenic and caused worse effect, it was only given in one dose. And it was conducted uh, mainly in the USA, the comparison study, but the preliminary B and T162 B1 studies and their immune system, immune response studies was done in Germany. Okay, a little about uh, the phase one part of the trial. What they did was, uh, I'll highlight some main points which I found interesting or controversial. One main point was that they had more females than males. Also, I think uh, it is also what the previous people suggested that that it is based on the healthcare workers, more female than male, but you know, who volunteered to be a participant, but it is, it was more females than males in FSA. Uh, although that's not an excuse, but there were more white people than any other. Well, it's U United States, so <laughs> the, if, there are more white people in the country, so I can understand why that would be. Yeah, but it was like way more white people, 93%. It's like just one black person volunteered and one Hispanic and two Asians. But anyway, uh, not going much into the phase one, I'll just highlight the main point and why the one vaccine is better than the other one. 
there were two previous studies which I told you about in Germany by Sahin et al. and Mulligan et al. about phase one clinical trial of BNT 162B1. And, but that study was mainly done in the volunteers of age group 18 to 55 years of age. And they also explained the CD4 plus, CD8 plus, and IgG responses against BNT 162B1. So I would highly recommend you to go uh, read that studies to know more about this part of the vaccine because I'll be talking more about this vaccine. Uh, but both the vaccines had below serious level of local and systemic reactions and which were dose dependent and temporary. And as I told you in the very introduction that although they are called adverse effects or side effects, we have them only when the, our body's immune response is acting against the virus. That means it is recognizing the virus and the, sorry, recognizing the vaccine and the vaccine is immunogenic. Otherwise, there will be no point of giving the vaccine if our body doesn't react to it in that way. So although it is called side effects, it, you should be happy that you're having that. Uh, and uh, the symptoms mainly picked uh, at the day after vaccination and got resolved within a week. BNT 162B2 showed uh, less lesser systemic um, adverse effects as compared to BNT162B1 in both the age groups, but mainly in the older age group population, which has higher probability of getting the virus, they showed a very significant difference in systemic reactions. And because they showed less systemic reactogenicity, hence it was chosen to move forward with in large scale clinical trials. In fact, the reactions reported by BNT162B2 group were very similar to those reported by the placebo group. Um, a little more about how they differ in each other is that they differ in the nucleotide sequence that encode the vaccine antigens and in the overall size of the RNA construct, which results in uh, a higher number of uh, RNA molecules in one as compared to the other. So the nuclear composition of RNA has been already reported in previous studies to affect its immune stimulatory activity and reactogenicity profile. And this is a possible explanation for the differences in the systemic reaction in these vaccines. Okay, so similar IgG levels and 50% uh, neutralization titers were observed between the samples from both vaccine groups. In this graph, you can see the first top panel is about the IgG amount in response to the vaccines. And the second panel is about the neutralizing antibodies, which are actually, will, which will be actually helping uh, stop the virus in the second or the bottom panel. And uh, <clears throat> the response, you can see the response after the first dose, which is in the first arrow and day one in each panel is almost nothing. But after the second dose, which is day 21, there is a significant uh, IgG as well as a significant, um, sorry, just the significant IgG. But after one or two weeks after the second dose, there will be the optimum or maximum in uh, IgG in all the age groups. And as for neutralizing antibody, after the first dose and the second dose, there isn't much neutralizing antibodies, but it takes time after one or two weeks after the second dosage, you can see the maximum 
neutralizing titer, which was higher in participants of age group 18 to 55 years of age as compared to age group 65 to 85 years of age. But still, it was very, very comparable with HSC, which is human convalescent sample. And this sample is a positive control. These are serum samples from patients who have survived COVID-19 and the antibodies which are present in their serum. So you can see the vaccine almost produces equal amount. Uh, but at least, okay, so this working of the immune system takes time and you do not get resistant immediately after the second dose and definitely not after the first dose. So be cautious and intelligent about when to exactly stop following the social distancing practices, which I would suggest stop following it maybe after the herd immunity, but definitely after two weeks after your second dose. Um, but at least this study showed the importance of administering the second dosage. And if you stop after the first dose, you will basically have nothing which is shown at day one at, at each time point. In the phase two and three of the study, now with the BNT162B2 vaccine, they had 43,548 participants above the age of 16. Now they divided the participants in one-to-one -one vaccine and placebo groups. They had two dosage of 30 micrograms and the study was conducted in USA. As I said, there were, uh, there were four multiple participants screened out of which uh, 43,448 were injected with either placebo or vaccine and they tried to keep the ratio one to one. And uh, then it shows how many people received dose one of the vaccine and dose one of the placebo. And after 21 days, they received dose two of either the vaccine or dose two of the placebo. And finally, the study was followed up uh, one to two months after the second dose, and they kept collecting the serum samples. One major uh, similarity that they kept in the study too was the maximum number of people were white. That is 83% of their participants were white. And, it's uh, much better than the safety trial. <laughs> I know. There's more than one uh, black person here. I know, right? <laughs> so, and something they improved on was the male to female ratio, which is almost one to one now. And they also improved on the age groups. They have 50% uh, of people in the age group of 16 to 55 and 50, sorry, 42% of people, participants who are above the age group of 55. Starting with the local reactions, local reactions including uh, pain at the site of injection or irritation or swelling, redness. Uh, the most faced reaction was mild to moderate, which you can see in green or blue color here. Most people face just mild or moderate local reactions only. There were almost no redness and swelling. Very, very few people faced it, but uh, multiple people faced pain at injection site, which was again resolved within one to two days. One thing to notice was that the participants of the age group 16 to 55 experienced more localized pain than participants above 55 years of age. The very good news was that there were not a single participant who reported a grade four reaction, 
So a grateful reaction is when, you know, the vaccine is actually can be harmful to certain people. Grateful reactions includes necrosis or exfoliative dermatitis, which can be life-threatening. So basically it's like uh, the vaccine is killing the cells in your body. So there were no grade four reaction in any people. And whatever mild or moderate symptoms they had was resolved in one to two days. Now they went and looked at the systemic reactions, which was more common in participants below the age group uh, 55 as compared to above 65 years of age. And most participant, more participants faced the symptoms after the second dose as, uh, as compared to the first dose. And the reasons behind them are not very, I mean, the reasons behind why younger people are facing more systemic reactions or why more systemic reactions are being faced after dose two is not clear yet. <clears throat> okay, so after they gave vaccines, dose one and dose two to the large population, they went forward and tested uh, the vaccine efficiency against COVID-19 after seven days of the second dose. Because as I said, the immune response and the neutralizing antibodies, they take time to produce and be on the optimum level. So after seven days, uh, they saw that there were eight to nine people in the vaccine group who got COVID as compared to 162 or 169 per people in the placebo group who got uh, COVID. And if you take the percentage, you see that the vaccine is almost 95% effective after the second dose, which is really, really good because FDA says that anything is a vaccine if it is 30%, just 30% effective, but it is this vaccine is 95% effective, which is much more than the minimum requirement. Um, <laughs> I, 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 can you go back? So look at that stats. Uh, Tanu, can you go back to the, yeah, look at the stats. The, what's the probability that this vaccine is more than 30% 30, 30 <laughs> efficacious and very high probability? <laughs> yeah. So, so I like how what, in science we can't say 100%. It has to be 99.999%. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> Just like your toothpaste, it can clear 99.9% .9 of the germs in your body. <laughs> but that one germ, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be on the side of caution. If somebody comes up with that one case and your whole one probability yeah, of one is ruined. Yeah, <laughs> if some one after getting the vaccine they're like how am i infected they're like see it's 99.999 percent <laughs> <laughs> and you are that 0 0.0001 percent who got it okay uh now coming to the efficiency based on the different age groups or other criteria, you can see that in all the age groups, whether above 60 per 16 years of age to above 75 years of age, the vaccine was very, very effective, uh, around 95%. Somehow in people above 75 years of age, it was 100% effective. But that is also because the, the number of participants about 75% of age was much lower as compared to the other age group. Uh, yeah, it was again 95, around 95% 95 effective in both male and female. Uh, in black population, it was 100% effective. So yay, <laughs> go uh, get vaccinated everyone. This is really good. Something to see also is that the efficiency after just one dose is not that good. You can see See in this graph, which I have uh, magnified here, the data is after uh, 
dose one and before dose two, the vaccine is just 52.4% effective. But uh, also after dose two to seven days after dose two, if you decide to throw your mask and have a party after dose two, you there is a 10% chance that you will get COVID because after dose two, it is 90% effective. Only after seven days after dose two, it is 95% effective. A little more from another study from Sahin et al. Say, tells about the immune responses against uh, by our body against this BNT162B2 vaccine. Tanu, just, just a heads up that uh, your screen is slightly blurry. So try to tell us more details in by audio. Okay. The first graph A here shows IgG, which is the total number of antibodies against this uh, vaccine. And the second graph here shows VNT, which is virus neutralizing titers, which are the specific antibodies which are helping in reduction or uh, neutralization of the virus. And the x-axis here shows the days after initial vaccination. And wherever there, at, there is the arrow, is when the second dose was given. So in each case, you can see after the first dose, uh, which is day eight here, sorry, seven days after the first dose, which is day eight here, there is no antibody production at all. And there is definitely no neutralizing antibody after the first dose. But after the second dose, there is a little IgG as well as a little uh, neutralizing antibodies production, which is the neutralizing antibody production is still below the lower limit of quantification, which is given as the dashed line over here. Then for, after... for neutralizing antibodies, mm -hmm. they do have to run an assay on it, right? You... True, yes. So you take the serum, get the, and try to see if, the, if it prevents virus binding to a cell line or primary cells. So that yes. seems that seems like a more elaborate assay than just measuring antibodies. So can you can you yeah. tell us why natural why these neutralizing antibodies are important? These neutralizing antibodies are important because these are the very antibodies which will be uh, responsible for basically tackling with the virus, uh, which are very very specific to the vaccine which you are giving. Okay. Yeah. And only after seven days or 14 days or any time after seven days after the second dose, you can see a maximum production of IgG, which is the total antibodies. And uh, similarly, there is a maximum production of neutralizing antibodies only after seven days after the second vaccine dose. Interestingly, this vaccine was seen to be working in 18 other pseudospecies of SARS-CoV-2, which had variations in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So in all that 18 different mutants, it were, had almost same or similar virus uh, neutralizing titers as compared to the wild type. And uh, one interesting thing that I saw there here was that as expected in one microgram only, which is the lowest dose, uh, the viral neutralizing titers is low, but at 10 micrograms, the virus neutralizing titers is actually higher, even higher than that of the 13 micrograms dose. It might come back to what we were discussing with Maria. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's sure. got to be an optimal dose, not too high, not too low. Yeah. But the 30 micrograms is the dose that they did the clinical trials three, two and three on. Okay. So, uh, good for them that mm -hmm. it worked still. Yeah. So it's 95%, you know. 
Uh, Maybe they could get ninety per ninety nine percent with that ten microgram dose. I don't know. Maybe yeah, that's maybe. me being an a- <laughs> Asian dad. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done better, right? <laughs> yeah, you could have done better. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay. This slide shows the CD four plus and CD eight plus T cell response, as well as the cytokine release after the second dose. So the cytokines still checked where IL-2, interferon beta, and IL-4. Firstly, this two things, CEFT and CEF, which I forgot the full uh, expanded form of, but these two were the positive controls. And uh, they compare S, which is the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine with the positive control. So as compared to the positive control, the CD, there were uh, higher interferon gamma producing CD4 T cells. And uh, compared to the positive control, they had almost an equal amount of CD8 plus, uh, sorry, interferon gamma producing CD8 plus T cell. Interferon gamma producing because for, SARS-CoV-2 immune response, it has already been seen in previous literature that interferon gamma has a really good uh, role. Yeah, I'll add something about interferon gamma here that Mm -hmm. uh, it ties very nicely with their increase in IgGs because interferon gamma is required for class switching of B cells from IgM to a specific subclass of IgGs that's very useful against viruses. And apart from the hundred other things that Infront Gamma does that I'll not talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the second graph over here, you can see that uh, this was pre. Pre means before vaccine was given and post as in after the second dose of the vaccine. Uh, uh, talking about IL-2, why they looked at IL-2 because IL-2 uh, plays a role in naive T-cell differentiation and proliferation into effector and memory T-cells, which is important to tackle with the virus. In IL-2 uh, production, in the pre-panel, you can see that there was almost no IL-2 production and uh, the first two graphs says that, but after the vaccine, there was IL-2 producing CD4 T cells and not that much IL-2 producing CD8 cells, but definitely a lot of IL-2 producing CD4 plus T cells. Now coming to IL-4, which was checked in CD plus, uh, CD4 plus T cells, again in pre, there was almost nothing, but in post, vaccination, they saw that the IL-4 is being secreted out. And that's IL-4, a very little bit. That's a yeah, very little bit increase. Little though. But IL-4 is a key regulator of humoral and adaptive immune response as along with T-cell proliferation, it also stimulates the B-cells and help in their differentiation into plasma cells. It's, since we are here, let me also throw a cool fact about IL-4 that I learned in a conference late mm-hmm. recently i don't think that's it's published could be published now il4 is also required for the proliferation of follicular dendritic cells mm-hmm. so more follicular dendritic cells in the germinal center allows for a better gc response mm-hmm. also il4 is a class switching factor for b cells but i don't think that should be useful here because we don't need iges that is mostly what il4 signals for okay uh, one uh, criticism I had that I know IL-4 and IL-3 had uh, very, very similar functions. So I thought that if they had so low response in IL-4, maybe they have they could have checked IL-13, but maybe they didn't have any response in or even lower response in IL-13. So okay. yeah. no idea. Uh, next, talking about the interferon gamma. They checked it for both CD8 plus and CD4 plus T cells. And there was, after vaccination, there were good enough production of interferon gamma in both inter, uh, CD4 plus and CD8 plus T cells. 
Now coming into the limitations of the study. Number one was that the number of severe cases was very, very low, which is a good sign as well as a bad sign because if the number of severe cases is low, you don't cannot research much about what will happen if someone gets a vaccine and then someone gets a serious infection. You don't know whether the infection which will be much more serious than placebo group or you don't exactly know what will happen in that case. So in the vaccine treatment group, only one person got severe uh, infection as compared to only nine in the control group, which is very too low to understand the severity of infection. The second thing was that the participants had the choice of getting tested if they experienced COVID symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the uh, people conducting the studies didn't recommend COVID testing. The participants had the choice to either get tested or not if they think they have COVID symptoms, but the vaccine Sorry, but because the vaccine group had more reactogenicity to the virus, they may consider the mild symptoms to be a result of the vaccine and not as a result of COVID infection because we know the COVID infection also uh, leads to fever or body ache. And most people get mild symptoms as compared to severe sy symptoms. So maybe they didn't get test tested because they thought that it was the reactogenicity and not COVID symptoms. This brings me to the next limitation, which is the rate of asymptomatic disease was not reported in this study, which is a import very important criteria as Samriti pointed out. And number four, the study was done in volunteers over 30, 16 years of age, so children, uh, pregnant women and immunocompromised individuals were not included in this study, but that is uh, pretty common for vaccine trials as studies on them are done separately and not mainly in the clinical trials. Uh, I believe these smaller details will generally be done by other subgroups in addition to the clinical trials and may, may be ongoing currently. However, for the majority of the population uh, in 16 to 85 years of age, the vaccine was found to be safe and successful and hopefully it can get rid of SARS-CoV-2 in the future any questions before I go forward yeah I had one thing so are they reporting their severe cases in control or page or the vaccine recipients if the people reported to them or are they going and checking these people the volunteers after a period of time no the volunteers had an electronic notebook kind of thing they could they needed to upload everything electronically after a certain period of time so uh, whatever they got to know about the local or systemic reactions as well as the severe effect everything was based on the what the participants reported Okay, so all the researcher, uh, we really want to acknowledge a lot of people for the vaccine trials as well as other things. Firstly, we want to thank all the researchers who went out of their comfort zone to work with a novel virus, which is, it doesn't, to hear it, it sounds very simple, but it is super challenging and complex. So they went forward, uh, went out of their comfort zone, worked with the novel virus and contributed to basic science knowledge and drug screening data, which if you remember, we had basic screening with remdesivir and uh, quinoquine, which was important to know that whether they're working or not to go forward and cancel those things then go forward and uh, do new vaccine trials. 
You forgot what about, about the major drug that was endorsed, bleach, <laughs> <laughs> which luckily yes. did not make it to the trials. <laughs> we also like to acknowledge the scientists who shared data. Uh, yeah, the scientists who shared data and developed methodologies and techniques, and finally made the vaccine. <clears throat> We would like to thank the clinical trialist who performed nonstop high quality work under pandemic health emergency conditions, staying away from their family for long period of time, for days, for months, wearing uncomfortable clothing, but still working for the benefit of the others. We would thank the volunteers, sorry, for the uh, volunteers who helped by participating in the studies and for participating, you need to believe in science, which you did. So thank you volunteers, you took part in the vaccine trials. Next, the government, uh, some more than the others uh, who created standard and market for the vaccine. And very, very thank you to our audience who compromised their la normal lifestyle to stay at home and support social distancing. And that's the end of our today's presentation. Hope everyone liked it. Jatin, do you wanna add something else or anyone, do you wanna add something else? I can stop the share screening. Well, Jatin, I wanna ask you as a third party viewer of our presentations, if you were given the choice, which vaccine would you get? Oh, as <laughs> I will go with the numbers that 95% sounds good. <laughs> Sometimes too good to be true, but well, yeah, I'll go for that. Right which now, I'm so which... desperate. I would just take any if they're giving me, but yeah, Including if I had the a choice. AstraZeneca one? Yeah, why not? You 70%. That's higher than 30%. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that was a very nice presentation, guys. It was a perfect start for the Saturday. Now I'll tell everybody around about what I listened to today and I'll realize people don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> uh, oh, we had some comments. Uh, Pawan Kumar Neglur, he said, uh, in indeed, it is a fact of life that not being able to say that something works 100%. And if you are an immunologist, yeah, if you, if you can say something works 70% of the time, that's wo way more than <laughs> what you should be com comfortable for. As an immunologist, you're constantly saying, yeah, that is something, but there's an exception, there's an exception, and there's always exceptions in that. Now we, ha now we know that because the main reason because why everything is differing from people to people is their microbiota, and we have mm -hmm. no control over that. A human has no control over someone else's microbiota. Uh, so it definitely will be different based on person to person, how you are getting the any symptoms, whether you're getting infected or not. And uh, this gives rise to a very cool area of study called personalized drugs, but definitely we cannot make personalized vaccines, right? But mm -hmm. if you want to research more about it, I'm talking to the audience that you can definitely go and research more about personalized drugs. Maybe in future there'll be we'll have distinct profiles of microbiota, and we'll be able to group people based on each profiles, and we can have safety efficacy data for each profile. So we'll know this drug works if this person falls into this category of microbiota. But again, there will be ninety five percent efficiency in those categories because people will differ. No, that's why we'll have to profile these people before take their poop samples. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> get get their microbiota. Uh -huh. I found and this. Also, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Maria, you continue, go. Continue, continue, continue. Um, okay, so uh, generally you are saying also uh, about uh, you're talking about microbiota, but also it's worth noting that also uh, the um, glycosylation profile might also be influencing how um, everything goes with vaccines because um, the antibodies can also be. Uh, distinctly glycosylated, which also is influenced, for example, by age, by our lifestyle, by generally by everything. So it also may influence how the vaccines work among uh, different people. But we also don't really uh, know that now in, in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
anybody thought about this that letting the ribosomes do all the work is good because it, we we I don't think we understand exactly what the ribosomes do. I know uh, we don't know what they do, but how or the to the exact details that we can replicate something, we can replicate a ribosome in in the lab. So I think just giving it the mRNA and doing it letting it do the job just like how it would let the virus transcribe its mrna it's the mm. safest control ever mm. yeah you can't go wrong if the, if the cell can make it for the virus can make it for you and that'll be closest to the real deal mm -hmm. because when you go to make proteins you have to work on so many details about the confirmation the post translational modification and then you inject it and it turns out no that's not immunogenic or not providing the same results. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's in a very like a natural context and, um, you know, everyone's uh, like what type of antigen, even just what type of antigen you're presenting is different between people depending on what HLA you have. So, yeah. you know, it's not necessary that it's going to be one type of epitope from the spike protein. So just giving the entire protein and letting the, your individual body just make um like cleave that protein into its individual epitopes is is i think much much more beneficial than just giving epitopes or giving proteins for sure yeah uh yeah i agree the hla is another confounding factor and we and there's just so much variety there that people don't even put people in category anymore with that it's just yeah. too much work yeah do you guys have any other questions any other remarks uh uh, I don't know, like uh, there are more than 100 other vaccine participants who are still ongoing studies, some of them which has just one dose as compared to two dose and uh, thinking it from the people's perspective, maybe the th uh, vaccines with one dose will get more popular in the future. But for now, we really believe that th these three vaccines, AstraZeneca, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, will be good enough for at least this year and people should definitely keep on social distancing even if after the first dose it's like nothing you get nothing so you have to be socially distanced but also at least one month after the second dose and till the herd immunity is achieved that is other people around you are getting vaccinated too um now that you know more about the vaccines, talk it out with more people who are not in the science field so that more and more people know about the vaccines they are taking. And once they know more about the vaccine, they would be more confident in putting something inside their body, which is not essential oils or uh, bleach, bleach. <laughs> disinfectant or any kind of special therapeutic food. <laughs> Yep, that's all. Spread the knowledge. That's what. That's how I want to end this. <laughs> Magda, do you want to say Maybe something? Maybe I will. I would add something because, as a medical student, student, I received the second dose of a coronavirus Pfizer vaccine yesterday, Ooh. and tonight I felt like some kind of dizzy. I had some chills and fever, but I'm very happy I got that. And maybe I will update you how do I feel uh, with the vaccine and how it works definitely so, yeah. i got a vaccine people, and i'm very happy uh, many people close to me got vaccinated with pfizer because it was my mom my sister my boyfriend my boyfriend's mom my boyfriend's dad so really uh, many people and uh, they all had some minor uh, adverse events like you know pain uh, a little bit of fever but they are all very happy to to get two doses so i think it's still quite beneficial and I think it's not much different from flu vaccine because I was vaccinated in November with flu vaccine and it was quite similar. I didn't have fever, but I had very serious arm pain, but mm -hmm. I feel it's still worth it. And last week I got also tetanus uh, vaccine because of my head injury and I also had arm pain, so I guess it's similar for everyone. Yeah. I remember having arm pains for like three to four days after I got my HPV, human papillomavirus vaccine. 
and uh, that was uh, discomfort to be true but then I was also happy that I'll be protected from it in my future yeah I ha- I've never had any discomfort with the vaccine so I have no stories to share with that regard Discomfort Maybe. is so much better than all the hospital cost you're going to have, yeah. uh, including your life cost if you get the virus, right? Yeah. But yeah, I think this would be a good point to end the discussion. Very nice uh, presentation, guys. I'm going to share this with people who don't agree with me so uh, <laughs> about vaccine safety so they can not watch the discussion and still not agree with the safety. <laughs> like have the essential oils you want but also have the vaccine <laughs> yeah together sure. better <laughs> okay i'm going to uh, end the stream now everybody was watching thank you guys we'll see you next week no next week we have a podcast scheduled so that'll be on the spotify but next to next week we've got dr katherine bosio who will be coming from and uh, yeah it will be coming from nih and she'll be talking to us about a very cool paper. I'll post about that. Okay. Thanks, everyone.